1st, 2nd, 3rd John for beginners. This is lesson number five in that section. And today's lesson, John's, the title of it is John's cover letter, which, uh, which is 2nd John. So we're continuing in our series of study on the epistles of John. And today we're going to cover 2nd John. Before we begin, however, um, I want to review the first epistle in order to refresh our memories as to the context of the letter, because all three letters work together. So the first epistle dealt with the problem of Gnosticism in the early church. Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis, which means knowledge. In the case of this teaching, however, it referred to occult or secret knowledge possessed by Gnostic teachers. Now Gnostics taught that we are souls trapped in a prison-like material world by an evil divinity. And we are kept unaware of our plight by the carnal seductiveness of this material world. Only those with the occult knowledge, the gnosis, of the true state of affairs could transcend this prison and enter into a higher reality. That was the idea of their teach, uh, teaching. Uh, they also taught that the good divinity dwelling above this evil realm would aid lost souls by sending a messenger of truth to reveal the deception. Now, it's a little bit of an old reference here, but do you notice that this is roughly the plot line for the 2003 movie, The Matrix. If you saw The Matrix, this was the plot line for the, for the Matrix and the star Reeves there. He was the actor who was the one. He was the one sent to reveal the truth that everybody was living in a deception, material world. So uh, you can see how easy it was to superimpose this teaching onto the gospel and make Jesus the one and make Jesus the messenger of truth. And they, the, they, the Gnostic teachers, the guardians of the secret knowledge. Kind of, you know, it was easy to put one on top of the other. There was only one problem with this, however. Jesus claimed that He was God and inhabited a human body. See, that didn't match the story line. You know, even in The Matrix, you know, the, the actor who played the one sent, the messenger, didn't claim that He was divine. Jesus also taught that the truth is what makes one free, but the truth was that we were prisoners of our own sinfulness and that our freedom from guilt and condemnation was accomplished through His ministry on the cross and received by faith, not secret knowledge. We're saved because we believe in Jesus, not because we know secrets, not because we have some sort of insight into some secret you know, or occult knowledge. As a matter of fact, Jesus commanded that this good news be shared with the entire world not kept secret. I mean, the whole idea with the Gnostic teachers is they had the secret knowledge and you had to kind of jump through hoops you know, and follow them if you wanted the secret knowledge. Well, you know, Jesus wasn't cooperating with that. He says, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to everybody. Well, there's nothing secret about that. Jesus empowered every soul to find salvation from sin, not just those who had the secret, he also taught that material things had no power to defile us. The material world was created by God who rules over it and it was a good thing when it was created. You know, and God saw all that He had made and behold it was very good, Genesis 1.31. So that part of their teaching, you know, that material world was bad, it was all bad, well, that, that didn't jive with what Jesus was teaching or what the what the Bible was teaching. Like all heretics, the Gnostic teachers tried to merge their teaching with the gospel, and nothing has changed throughout the centuries. They denied that Jesus was actually God, 
and they said that he was a, you know, an apparition of God or that he became human only at the cross, but not that he was God and man simultaneously from birth to the cross and beyond. They mixed in certain Jewish traditions and food laws and they taught that to be free from the evil corruption of this material world, you had to practice asceticism, in other words, the denial of the flesh. You know, let's face it, if you have a spiritual teacher that controls what you eat and controls your sex life, pretty much controls you. And that's what they were doing. Laws against marriage, you know, uh, what you could eat. Every cult group, they always start there. They always start with prohibitions on what you eat and prohibitions about what is le legitimate sexual expression, obviously within marriage and so on and so forth. But you know, they always try to control those two areas. No different from, from these guys. Some of them taught the opposite that since the soul is separate from the flesh, whatever you did in the flesh didn't matter. And of course, this attitude led to a hedonistic lifestyle and behavior. If, if what I do in my body doesn't affect my soul, well boy, I could just, you know, any, any desire my flesh has, I can just give into it because it doesn't really matter. So these teachers were having a great influence on the church, creating confusion and doubt among, uh, among the believers. And so in response to this, John the Apostle writes a letter and begins with his eyewitness account of Jesus, the Jesus who did and said things only a divine being could say and do, the Jesus that John actually saw and heard and touched in human form. He begins there. Now, in the first epistle, we reviewed how John encouraged his readers to be confident in their salvation without the special knowledge or the practices of the false teachers. He wrote that there were three ways to be certain of their salvation. First of all, they could have certainty by walking in the light. I mean, they know that they are saved because they live and they act like saved people. They can be certain by abiding in love, he writes. They know that they are saved because they act out of love in every situation or attempt to act out of love in every situation. And they can be certain of their salvation by abiding in faith. They know they are saved because they believe and rely on Jesus, not secret man-made knowledge for their salvation. So John's gospel told the story of Jesus' incarnation, his work on the cross, his resurrection, so on and so forth. John's first epistle encourages his readers to believe that information. He doesn't repeat all of it in his epistle because he's given it in the gospel. Okay? The two, the gospel, the epistle, they work together to tell us that we will leave our flesh, but not through secret knowledge. We will leave our flesh through faith in Jesus Christ based on our knowledge of Him. And there's no secret about that. That knowledge is available to everyone. All right, so there's a little review of uh, 1 John, okay? So this brings us to the second epistle. This letter, um, 2 John, much shorter and covers much the same material actually. What is interesting is uh, how this letter was used. Second John is not a continuation of John's gospel, nor is it a continu continuation of the first uh, epistle. It's a cover letter that accompanied the epistle and the gospel. You know, those of you who work in offices, you, know, you, have a, you have a stack of information and then you put a cover letter and say, attached, you will find you know, the, the statistics for the, la the last quarter or something like that, right? That's a cover letter. Well, 2 John is a cover letter for 1 John and for the Gospel of John. It was written to a specific church with the intention of warning about the things which he speaks about in detail in the first epistle. 
And the main point of this letter is to warn the church of the great danger posed by the false teachers and their teachings. John says that they needed to be vigilant in this, in being careful. So here's the outline of this second epistle. Again, one chapter, 13 verses. A salutation, a commendation of the individuals that he's writing to, a warning, and a brief conclusion at the end. So let's take a look at the text, shall we? Salutations, uh, that's we said verses one to three, so let's read verse one and two for now. It says, the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So John is the elder, he was old at this time, a leader in the church at Ephesus. The chosen lady and her children are the church. He writes this to a particular congregation. He uses the euphemisms because of the danger of persecution at the time. So he doesn't use the word church. Chosen lady and her children is a reference to the church. Uh, he says that he, he loves this church uh, as all those who hold uh, to the truth also love the church. He loves the church that holds to the truth and all those who hold to the truth, they love the church. The truth, of course, is the gospel. And in this case, the essential truth of the gospel that Jesus is the divine Son of God and Savior because that's what, you know, at core, that was the issue. These teachers were denying the central core belief of the gospel that Jesus is divine and human at the same time. Okay? So all those who love this truth are loved by John and by one another because it is this truth that binds all Christians together in love forever. And you know, you, you, You've all traveled, you go somewhere on vacation and you decide, you, know, you go to the phone book or whatever online, and you, well, there must be a church around here somewhere, right? And so you find a congregation and uh, you know, on Sunday morning, you put away the bathing suits and whatever and you, you head off to service on a Sunday morning and you go in and oh hi, you're here on vacation. And you know, you're there 30 minutes and you got friends for life it seems. I don't know about you people, but when Lisa and I would travel and you know, go to services wherever we were on Sunday, we were almost the last ones to leave because people would start talking in the foyer after the service and uh, do you know so and so? And you'd find out that you knew people that know each other. You know, it's like family. Well, what is it about that? I, I, go, I go to Walmart, the same Walmart, you know, 10 times a week to pick up stuff. I don't feel that. <laughs> I don't feel that with those people. I, do, I go to Kohl's for the deals. They're giving me great deals, but I don't feel that feeling. Why? Well, because I'm a customer and I'm treated, well, like a customer. When we're in church, we're treated like family. And, and what is the thing that holds us together? We know without asking the question, that the person we're talking to also believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Also believes that when they die, they're going to heaven. We don't have to confess that every time. The fact that we're going to take the communion you know, tells that about us and tells that about them. That's what we share. That's what he's talking about. The spirit of love, even with people you don't know, you have an immediate bonding relationship. Verse three, he says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So he pronounces a blessing from God and he places the source of the divine blessing equally at the feet of both God the Father and Jesus Christ. That's significant. It's one thing to say, you know, I pray that God blesses you but when you say, I pray that God and Jesus bless you, you're putting both of those on an equal level. So there's some confusion about who Jesus really is. And John settles the matter immediately by referring to Jesus as equal and of the same nature as God. 
and he asks for three things that only God you know, can give. Grace, a favor, a free pass to avoid punishment from sin. Nobody else can give you that, nobody. You can forgive one another offenses you know, that you've done against each other, so and so, I don't know, you know breaks your, you know, at your house, knocks over one of your vases you know, or something, oh, I'm terribly sorry, and then you know, next week shows up at your door with a replacement vase and a you know, thank you card and stuff like that. You know, we can forgive each other those things and kind of try to make some kind of restitution, but nobody can say, you know what, I, you know, bud, we're going to forgive all your sins. It'll take a couple of weeks, but we're going to forgive all your sins. <laughs> Nobody can do that. Who's got, who's got the power and the right to forgive you all of your sins? Only God. And then he says mercy, you know, compassion for our weaknesses and our failures. Again, only God can do that. And peace, no war, no judgment because of our sins. Peace, not between each other, peace between us and God. Again, things that only a divine being can give. So John asks for these blessings on the people from God and Jesus, thus securing a blessing for his readers, but also reaffirming the exalted position of Jesus Christ far above the position given to him by the false teachers. You know the false teachers because in some way they always bring Jesus down. They never bring him up. They never make him more exalted than he already is. They always bring him down just a little or a lot. You can tell who they are by that type of teaching. He moves on in his letter to the commendation, as I said, verse four, five, and six, I think. Verse four, he says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. So in contrast to the Christians who have been deceived or those who are doing the deceiving with their false teaching, John commends those, some of them in that church, who were living according to the truth, according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. Once again, he relates the teaching and the revelation concerning the gospel of Jesus to the Father, as opposed to the human concepts being proposed by the Gnostic teachers. In other words, the teaching of the gospel doesn't come from the apostles. It comes from God, and God gave it to the apostles, and the apostles gave it to the, you know, to the people as opposed to the false teachers. You know, he doesn't spell it out here, but you read between the lines, these guys, we don't know where they got their teaching from, but they certainly didn't get it from God. Verse five, now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Their proper understanding of who Jesus really is will be reflected in their lifestyle what he talked about in 1 you know, John. The distinguishing lifestyle of one who truly understands the gospel and accepts Jesus as the divine Lord is love because this is the lifestyle that Jesus modeled. He modeled a lifestyle of love. Well, those who follow him try to do the same. In verse six, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. So John merely summarizes the entire life and teaching of Christ into one word, and that word is love. If you love God and Christ, you will love others. You will love self, and you will obey Jesus' commands. He commends those who have believed correctly and have acted correctly based on their belief. And again, what is not spoken here is that uh, incorrect belief often leads to incorrect actions. If you believe, for example, the incorrect teaching that whatever you do in your body does not affect your soul in any way, shape, or form, then your actions will begin to reflect that belief you will just begin to give in to your flesh and do whatever your flesh wants. Remember I mentioned to you before, 
the teachers in the Bible, they teach something, a particular thing, and then they refer back to it at some point in another epistle or later on in the same epistle. Well, they don't go back and give all the information every time they mention the topic. Otherwise, the Bible would be like a thousand, five million pages long. Okay? So that's what he's doing here. Just making a reference to something he's already taught previously. Then we move to the warning. Now that he's spoken to the Christians, who have stood fast in doctrine and practice, he turns his attention to those who are being swayed by the false teachers, verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So he actually describes the false teachers by describing the essence of their doctrine. And the essence of their doctrine is that Jesus was not fully human. These, these false teachers, that he wasn't fully human, he was just a spirit. Since then we've had groups teach the opposite. He wasn't really a, a divine spirit, he was just human, or he was just spirit for a time. He accuses these teachers of being deceivers, not simply an innocent mistake, not simply a lack of understanding or maturity, but purposefully deceiving people with their teachings. That is a strong accusation. I mean, we all make mistakes, right? You can't, you can't study the Bible and talk about the Bible or even teach the Bible without mistakes or without, you know, maybe it's only superficial what you're teaching. You're not getting to the core of it. We all make mistakes. Hopefully, they're mistakes based on misunderstanding, a misreading, a lack of maturity, but they're not on purpose. But he says these teachers on purpose are doing this for their own ends, their own goal. He charges them with being a pawn of the Antichrist, which is that force which exists in the world under many guises with the purpose of defeating the gospel of Christ and his church. You know, Jesus spoke of false Christs and false prophets who would come into the world with the purpose of deceiving the saints in the name of Jesus. Imagine. You know, people have a hard time believing that someone who is supposed to be a quote religious person, you know, a Bible teacher or an evangelist or something like that, would actually on purpose deceive people, but we've seen a lot of that, haven't we? So by referring to the deceiver, the antichrist, John is pointing to the source or the power behind these lying spirits and prophets, and that is Satan himself. He's always the source of the lie, all the time. You know, I've said to you many times, uh, what you're, what's going on in your brain and that, that self-talk that's going on, always ask yourself, who's talking to me? Is this the Lord talking to me or is this the, the evil one talking to me? And he calls them you know, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, you know, when I see a, a movement whose goal is to uh, take prayer out of the schools, who's leading that charge? Jesus? No. When I see a movement that says, we, we're not going to pray anymore, we, we don't want the Bible to be uh, uh, used anymore, who's leading that charge? I won't start naming names of organizations that we know in this world, but just take a look at the purpose of their organization and ask yourself if, they're, if, the, if, if, if what they're doing is tearing down the kingdom or limiting the kingdom or limiting Christianity, you know who's behind it. And the problem is people who are in the power of the Antichrist many times don't even know that. They don't even realize it themselves. So in verse eight and nine, he goes on, he says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. I've had people say to me, well, how could you, wow, you know, how can you say that Christians are the only ones you know, that are going, how can you say such a thing? You know, I mean, what about those 
and I won't even name the religion, okay? What about those millions and millions of people you know, who believe this thing over here? And they're sincere about it. And I said, yeah. I said, well, I have one question for you. Do they believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, no, they don't. They actually reject that idea. Well, OK, read 2 John. and I may go before God to be judged, as we all will, but I don't think I'll be judged incorrectly for having said publicly that the Bible teaches only Jesus is the Son of God and only through Him we can have salvation. Yeah, you know, beat me up, kill me, do whatever you want. I can't change that truth. And even if I denied that truth, it would still be true. <laughs> that would be on me. Some people wonder, you know, why isn't the church growing? How, come, how, come, you know, how can we make the church grow? Well, we need to get serious about getting that message out. So the warning here is, is, is couched in terms of what you gain or lose by being careful not to be deceived. If you remain faithful to the gospel of Christ, then you keep your reward, which is eternal life, and your relationship with the Father and the Son. If you fall away from the teaching, then you risk your reward and your relationship. This is a good answer to those who claim that doctrine is not really important or essential. I've heard that a lot of times. Well, doctrine, not important. As long as you love, as long as you're a good person, there are a lot of good people who will not have eternal life. To have wrong doctrine and practice of Christianity can lead to the loss of faith and consequently to the loss of reward. This is exactly what John is saying here. Exactly what he's saying. Be careful. You lose the true gospel, well then you lose the relationship with God that the true gospel gives you. Verse 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. A practical addition and way to implement the warning. He's given them a warning and now he's given them a way to implement that warning. Now in those days, the offering of hospitality to strangers was an important social practice, more so than today especially for Christians. It was a sign of Christian love and faith and maturity, and it was also a way of providing support for preachers and teachers in the church who at that time circulated. Very few churches at that time had their own you know, full quote, full time preacher. They, they circulated, they went from church to church to teach and to preach. And so the offering of hospitality was a way of supporting these men who were going from place to place. Today we call it circuit preaching, but you know, that's what they were doing. So John says that one was not bound to offer hospitality even uh, to a teacher or preacher if that person did not maintain a proper teaching of the gospel. You know, the basic teaching for a soul's salvation. John says, on the contrary, to discourage him by denying him hospitality. Don't even greet that person, he says. Now this seems harsh, but understand that the false teachers were sowing seeds of a soul's destruction with their doctrines. They had to be stopped. And this was one way that they could be stopped. So John warns the brethren not to allow false teachers the opportunities to set up a base for teaching uh, other people in their homes, because that's how the teaching was done. You know, we have a quote program sometimes, you know, house churches or a small group, that's it. We have small group programs. A lot of churches have those. You know, members meet in homes during the week, fellowship, teaching, encouragement. But in the first century, that was like the mainstay. You know, the, most of the churches were in homes. And so you, you, you welcomed the teacher or the preacher and you offered him hospitality, and then he taught your house church. <coughs> excuse me, the two of those things went together. So when, when he says don't offer them hospitality, at the same time they would be then denying them the opportunity to teach the church that was in their house. A very practical approach. He concludes by saying that even to offer the usual greeting, you know, the hope that all is well or that God will bless their efforts, was not to be given 
lest they offer any type of encouragement to these people. This is why I don't feel any guilt in refusing money to religious causes who don't honor Jesus as Lord, nor do I allow any group or person into my home to teach or promote an idea that disclaims the, the position of Christ. No thank you, Jehovah Witnesses. You, you, you believe Jesus is an angel of some kind. No thank you. Mormons, yeah, have a nice day. Goodbye. I don't even debate them. Don't even debate them. Nope. Conclusion, verse 12 and 13. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face uh, so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister uh, greet you. So John ends on a personal note that is more fully explained in his third letter, which we're going to do next week. The problem in general has been addressed the issue of false teachers and their teachings, uh, how to respond to these. A more personal problem exists in this church involving certain individuals, so John says he would rather deal with these issues in person and not in writing. And he uh, closes with a final greeting from the church where he is based, which is Ephesus. Uh, we don't know which particular congregation that this uh, letter went to, but it's pretty general and you know, it can be applied in a general way. All right, a couple of lessons that we uh, can take away here. Number one, doctrine is important. I mentioned that already. Incorrect teaching and understanding can cause us to lose our salvation. So it's important for uh, uh, leaders, elders, teachers, preachers to be on guard at all times to have a correct response to these things, to reprove those who teach and promote false ideas, Romans 16, 17. You know, not all doctrine is equally important, of course. You know, some people think, uh, well, you, you know, while, you're, while we're having you know, worship and praise, uh, some people you know, think, well, let's, let's clap hands, you know, we're enthusiastic. Other people feel, well, we ought not to do that during uh, worship, okay. Uh, the correct answer to that is not as important as who is Jesus? That's my point that I'm making. There's a correct answer to all the issues, okay? But not all teaching is equally important. All teaching is equally from God. We must obey all the teaching. Even Jesus said that. You, know, you should have concentrated at the important things, he said, including the smaller things. So we don't deny the smaller teachings or the, the less important teachings. We need to have those correct as well. But we know there are more important teachings, especially those surrounding our salvation. Doctrine, however, is important. Number two, doctrine guides actions. What you do is based largely on what you believe. Many who do not act like Christians usually lack proper teaching and understanding. That's why they act the way they do. And then number three, Doctrine decides discipleship. You know, I said before, lots of nice people reject Jesus. Lots of nice people reject Jesus. Uh, in Montreal, I think Hal remembers, the AV company that came to set up our, you know, our, uh, our projectors and screens in the church in Montreal was a Muslim. We tried to find a company, he had the best price, he, he, he was willing to come out and set everything up for us, you know, a turnkey operation. Very friendly guy, nice, you know, we didn't talk about religion, I mean, he was in the church. I knew he was a Muslim, he obviously knew I was a Christian, you know. He did a good job, we paid him promptly, you know, a nice business transaction, nice guy, good guy. But I don't think he's going to heaven because he's a nice guy. You, you can have a friend or you can have a family member and you can have a relationship with that person. You can love that person, absolutely. But the one thing you can't have if they're not Christians, you can't have fellowship with that person. You know, I love my mom. She's passed many, many years, but I love my mother as, as we all do. And we had a lot of conversations and things like that. And you know, she was a very good, very good woman, worked very hard. But she was not interested in religion. She was never interested in discussing anything about the Bible, about Jesus, nope. So the thing we couldn't have is fellowship. 
We could never sit around and you know, discuss the Lord and His Word and how the spiritual life was going. That, that was taboo, couldn't talk about that. So sometimes that's difficult for us as Christians. And, and, I, and I need to kind of emphasize the idea that it is okay to, you know, some people say, well, I, you know, if, we, if they can't be Christians then I can't have any relation. No, of course not. You have family, you have friends at work, co-workers, partners, you know, whatever, who are not believers. That doesn't mean you cannot love them, you cannot have a friendship with them, some kind of relationship with them, a work relationship, or you, know, you guys bowl together, or golf together, whatever. You know. It's just you can't have fellowship together. That's, it's a dimension of your relationship that you can't have. Now, if, if your love for that person over time begins to kind of break them open to perhaps wanting to hear the gospel, that's marvelous because you have an opportunity then to add a dimension to your relationship which will make it even that much more satisfying. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see what we got. All right, reading. Uh, that'll take you all of about two minutes. <laughs> there you go. You, you, can, you can do the assignment between the bells, okay? But we will do 3 John, and then as I mentioned, our last class for this quarter, we're, we'll do uh, Philemon, uh, also a one chapter book, and we'll get all these short epistles done this quarter. All right, thank you very much for your attention.